Welcome back to another video in the AP Psychology series. This is lesson number three on experimental research. And uh, this is going to be a really quick video because there's not a whole lot to say. But basically what we're going to look at is kind of the parameters around what is experimental research and uh, how is that going to be different from more of the descriptive correlational style research that will be covered in the next video. So here we go. Uh, basically, there are three scientific goals within using the experimental research method. And so, as you can see here, there are measurement and description, understanding and prediction, and then application and control. And so, each one of these goals kind of serves a purpose to describe overall why would someone use the experimental research method and what exactly would be the benefit of that. So, it can be to from the, from the beginning basically developing a technique to study whatever it is you're looking at. Um, after that basically making some type of hypothesis about what you think is going to happen, um, identifying the variables involved, and then lastly okay now you've conducted this experiment, what have you learned? Is there anything that you can apply this research to? Are there any practical problems that you can solve? And so uh, one of the things this is going to rely on quite a bit is the scientific method, which is probably a review idea from a general science class or just school period. And so while I'm not going to go through the five steps of the scientific method, they are posted here for you. Um, as a psychologist conducting research, one of the big goals would be to uh, have some type of finding that you can post into a journal that can then be evaluated by your peer psychologists who are going to try to uh, replicate and or criticize your findings. And so one really big aspect of the experimental method, anytime you're involving variables for your study, is that you need to operationally define the variables. And I've found that usually students have a hard time remembering what the operational definition is or how to describe what it is or how to apply it. So if you look here, it does say operational definitions, how you measure your hypothesis. So the operational definition in itself is a very clear and concise, but also a definition that uses precise and certain words that is really going to say exactly what it sounds like. How are you going to operationally define your variables? So if you are doing some type of study that involves measuring sleep, for example, you have a normal amount of sleep that you're going to say your participant is going to get every night. So if you are looking at measuring how a particular food impacts their sleep, your operational definition is going to concern itself with the lack of sleep. And so you might say that you're operationally defining a a lack of adequate sleep as maybe four hours less than their normal amount of sleep. And I know this might sound a lot more confusing than it might actually appear, but in the end, what you are trying to do is to describe how you're going to measure your hypothesis. So if you're thinking this particular type of food is going to cause someone a significant lack of sleep, then you would need to say, how do you define what a significant lack of sleep is? A normal person can understand sleep as, you know, eight hours. That's a general kind of ballpark that's thrown out there range for how much people need to sleep. But lack of sleep might be different to different people. Some people might say, you know, they only sleep 50% of the time. They might sleep only six hours as opposed to eight. So that's really why there is some importance for measuring your variables and describing how you're going to do so by giving an operational definition. So the main purpose of the experimental method is basically to look at a variable and monitor and measure how it impacts another variable. So you're manipulating one variable and then you are measuring the effect on another variable, hopefully through controlled conditions. So you can have some bad experiments where everything goes wrong and uh, it's not properly controlled and that's gonna mess up your results. But in an ideal setting, you are measuring how one variable that you change under some carefully controlled conditions is going to possibly impact another variable. So that's what you're measuring. So the main strength of the experimental method is that it permits the ability to show a cause and effect relationship. So this is often referred to as causation. 
and it basically means x may cause y. One of the big weaknesses of the experimental method is that generally they are pretty artificial. They're, you're going to be manipulating things that may or may not actually happen in the natural environment. And there are some things that just cannot be studied because it might not be practical. For example, if you are wanting to see how certain hardcore drugs may affect uh, someone who found out they were pregnant, um, you would not be allowed to do some type of study like this because it may cause harm to the actual participant, which would be the pregnant woman. So there are two types of variables involved in your experimental method. Primarily, you look at the independent variable and the dependent variable. And so this is really basic. The independent variable is just whatever you manipulate or control, and the dependent variable is what you are monitoring or measuring as if it was affected or not by the independent variable. And so I'm not sure if you're able to read this cartoon that was found on a quick Google image search, but on the left we have a woman, she's the independent variable, and she says, nothing you do affects me, I'm independent. And so the man, presumed to be maybe her husband or her boyfriend, he says, some things you do affect me, and he's the dependent variable. And so if you understand this concept, then you might find that to be slightly humorous. Maybe not. It depends on your sense of humor. Um, within the experimental method, you have two types of groups. Generally, you're going to have an experimental group. This is the group of people that will receive some special treatment. And then you're going to have a control group. And these are the people that receive nothing special. So nothing changes for them. Usually, I tell my students, if we are going to have an experiment where we test out a particular type of candy or food and how it impacts your test score. So some of you who get the food, you're going to be, if my hypothesis is that you get the food, it helps your test score go up by 10 points, then um, the people who get the food, they're going to be the experimental group. The ones who get nothing special, no special treatment administered, they are part of the control group. And then, uh, kind of getting to the end, there are some other confusing type of variables. So, you have extraneous variables, which are anything that is not the independent variable that could likely influence the dependent variable in the study. Then you have the confounding of variables, which is when you have an extraneous variable that mixes with your independent variable, combining to make it hard to tell if or which one is actually impacting your results, what you're measuring in the dependent variable. And so, uh, going back to the quick example about snack foods impacting your test score. So some other possible extraneous variables could be your test taking abilities. How much sleep you got the night before. It could be generally uh, how much you studied or uh, if you are familiar with that test, if you've already taken it once. Those are all things that could influence the dependent variable. So you try to control these by basically putting some carefully controlled conditions in place, also using random assignment, which I'll explain in a second. Confounding of variables is really going to be when it actually happens. And so if you don't carefully control your settings in this experiment, then it might be possible that someone takes a test who gets a snack and their score goes up. But you ask that person later and you find out they also studied really hard the night before or they have taken that test before. And so now you have a really hard time just deciphering between did your snack food help in raising their test score or was it because they are a great test taker, they studied hard, they have a lot of familiarity. So that's really when your variables are kind of confounding together and impacting your results. Random assignment is going to be a strategy often used in the experimental method to give everyone an equal chance of being part of a controlled group or an experimental group. And so some people might be really good test takers. They may be offset by the fact that some other people may be really bad test takers. And so through random assignment, some may go to each group, which ultimately is going to help control the test taking ability. Rather than if you inherently put a group of kids that you knew are great test takers all in the experimental group, that already is setting up your experiment for failure because how are you going to know if your snack food is helping or not? In terms of the variation of the group, it is preferred to use a within subjects design, which basically means that one group of subjects serves both as the experimental group and their own control group. The subjects are literally within 
the experiment. So you have a group of people who are part of the control and they're part of the experimental group. So they're both part of the same. It is also possible to have a between subjects design where you have two separate groups, one control group, one experimental group. So in that one, it might be that I have my first period class act as a control group and my second period class act as the experimental group. The problem with that is that then there are other variables and considerations. Whereas I could just do the whole experiment on my first period and have some of them within that class be part of the control and some of them be part of the experiment. And finally, I'll leave you with a cartoon about utilizing the double-blind procedure, which ultimately helps eliminate experimenter bias so that your head researcher involved doesn't know who belongs to which group and the people involved don't know which group they belong to as well, which will help eliminate the experimenter bias. All right, thanks for joining, and hopefully you will join me next time for lesson number four, which will look at the descriptive and correlational style of research. Thanks.